politicians called on the Greeks to sell their islands. We give you cash, you give us Corfu, was one of the less tactful headlines. <laughs> In turn, the Greeks were furious and reminded the Germans they still owed Greece money from their time as occupiers in World War II. The currency that was supposed to be bringing Europe closer together at this stage was causing new divisions. Germany, with its stellar econ economy, became Europe's indispensable power. Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, became Brown Europe. An interesting exchange at one of those many summits that I've had the fortune and perhaps misfortune to come came okay, when President Sarkozy of France turned to Angela Merkel and said, you know, you and I are made to get on. We are the head and legs of the EU. No, Nicola, replied the German Chancellor. You are the head and legs. I am the bank. <laughs> Europe had changed fundamentally. There were key differences, particularly at the beginning. President Sarkozy, and this relationship between President Sarkozy and Angela Merkel in the early stages of this crisis was absolutely fundamental. Now, President Sarkozy blamed Chancellor Merkel for acting too slowly, for putting, in his view, the future of the euro at risk. Uh, these two people, as I say, who were fundamental to the crisis, could not have been more different. Uh, as I write in my book, she was cautious and analytical, he was hyperactive and impulsive. She disguised her ambition, he flaunted it. She was married to a chemistry professor who loved opera, he was married to a supermodel who loved a town. <laughs> Merkel would stop in her local convenience store near the Friedrichstrasse station, Sarkozy headed for Fouquet's on the Champs Elysees. He flashed his Rolex, she did not even wear a ring. She, she recoiled from showiness, he reveled in the full glare of political theatre. He loved the physicality of campaigning, the backpacking, the touching of strangers. She hated his gallant embrace. Now, Socrates wanted European solidarity for Germany to deploy its economic might behind struggling countries like Greece. Angela Merkel was determined that the German taxpayers did not become the paymasters of Europe, with the EU turning into a transfer union with German money flowing to the south. But I should say that the relationship between these two powerful leaders matured and later became strong and effective. Now, as you know, Greece was only the beginning after Greece came Ireland. In time, Ireland was bailed out despite fierce resistance. They had even set up what they called a war room to try and resist. The truth was that when the country guaranteed the deposits in its banks, it took on a level of debt it could not support. And the country was put under great pressure from the ECB to accept the rescue. They feared that uncertainty in Ireland could unsettle Italy and Spain, and eventually Ireland caved in. The finance minister said he stood at Dublin Airport and felt hell was at the gates. And many in Ireland did feel humiliated. One paper asked whether the Republican fighters in 1916 had died for a bailout from the German Chancellor with a few shillings of sympathy from the British Chancellor on the side. Ireland felt deeply hurt when it had to accept the bailout. Then Portugal followed, then Greece a second time, then Spanish banks, and then Cyprus, all in time, uh, needed help. And who would have imagined that three years after the crisis began, depositors in two Cypriot banks, if they had over 100,000 euros deposited, <coughs> could lose, and may yet still lose, up to 60% 60, 60 of what they had invested. Now these rescues or bailouts often came at a heavy price. The Germans insisted that countries not only cut their spending and their deficits, but also reform their economies, making it easier, for instance, to hire and fire staff or workers, for example. There was, if you like, a grand bargain Germany would save the euro, but at a price. Other economies would have to become more like Germany. They could not devalue, after all, they were in a single currency. All they could do was to slash spending and bring down their costs to become more competitive. And over time, Angela Merkel came to see saving the euro as central to her legacy. 
But in Europe, she ushered in an age of austerity. It was also a giant gamble which we are living with today. Because it turned traditional economics on its head. In the midst of a downturn, countries were cutting demand. And some of those countries tumbled into a cycle of decline. As I mentioned earlier, Greece's Prime Minister, Mamadou Antonis Samaras, spoke not of a recession, but of a Great Depression. In just five years, the Greek economy has shrunk by 25%. As I say, that is unprecedented in the modern era. This year, the sixth, it is expected to contract by a further 4%. And herein lay the great di disconnect. It should never be underestimated the will and determination of the current generation of European leaders to fight and defend the wider European project. But some of those officials never saw the consequences of their policies. And for me, covering this, this was the great disconnect. I could go to Brussels and go to these summits, sometimes which were pretty impenetrable, and they would come away and say, we've taken a giant step towards sorting out this crisis. And then I would travel to some of these countries, European countries that many of us go on holiday in, and you would see uh, the extraordinary cost that was being borne by those countries in order to keep the Eurozone together. Now, in Greece, thousands of people became dependent on food kitchens. And I was always struck by uh, something which a former foreign editor of a Greek paper wrote. I thought it was very poignant. He said, we are fighting to keep our dignity intact and to avoid the depression that is enveloping the country. We are luckier than the people who are forced to live in their cars. They park at a different spot every few days and usually rely on the kindness of strangers for bath and toilet facilities. And that's happening in a European camp. And there was, as you know, a sharp increase in suicides, and it happened in, not only in Greece, but in Italy and in Spain. And one of them in Greece was public. Dimitris Christoulis shot himself in St. Agnes Square, the main square outside Parliament. And he left a note which read that he could not face the prospect of scavenging through garbage bins for food and becoming a burden to my child. And Greece only recently was demoted by a ratings agency from being a developed nation uh, to the status of an emerging market. Now, in Spain too, as the property market collapsed, tens of thousands of people no longer could pay their mortgages. The figure stands at the moment that over 400,000 people have been evicted from their homes. Uh, the numbers of unemployed soared. It helped create what became known in Greece as the Hotel Mama Effect, uh, because it is now usual for people in their 30s to be living at home with their parents. Uh, and you know, this is a lost generation growing up uh, without work. And this crisis, as I've reported on several times, has led to a great migration with some of the best and brightest heading abroad. In Ireland, over 100,000 have left in the last two years, many, as before in their history, heading west. In Spain, they reckon over 100,000 graduates have left the country. This year, 35,000 uh, Spanish people will head to Germany. Uh, one of the most popular courses at the moment in Spain is to learn German, because they believe that's where the best chance of jobs lie. And in Portugal, a great irony, Tens of thousands of people have left that country for the countries they once colonized. Angola, Mozambique. It is easier, they take the view at the moment, to find work in Africa uh, than Portugal. Now, you know, Germany is often blamed for this, and I personally have seen in Cyprus, Greece, Spain, and Italy, Angela Merkel depicted as Hitler. Of course, it is an absurd and insulting comparison. But in Greece, when Merkel visited, there were protesters there in full Nazi uniform. In Italy, during the elections, when I was down in Naples, I heard a socialist candidate say to the crowd at one point, go to show Angela Merkel, it is not a German Europe. And the Germans, I believe, are acutely sensitive about this, and they face a really difficult dilemma. They believe the euro must be saved, they believe the policies they're pushing are right, 
But they don't want to be in a position of telling the rest of Europe what to do. But some of the time, the rest of Europe is saying, you know, the Germans must step in. And it was their foreign minister, Guido Westerwelle, who recently said, I warn us, that I warn other Germans, against any form of Teutonic snootiness. Rather sort of odd phrase, but that's what the, uh, uh, the foreign minister said. But alongside all of this, I've also encountered huge admiration for what Germany uh, has achieved. Now, in all of this, Britain was the outsider, but the Eurozone crisis has profound implications for the UK. On the, hand, on the one hand, there were plenty of people who said, well, I told you so. They never believed such disparate countries could be yoked together with the same currency. On the other hand, Britain needed a strong, growing Eurozone to trade with. Now, after repeated calls, uh, particularly from David Cameron, for Europe to get out the big bazooka and fix the crisis, at one stage, President Sarkozy finally lost his patience with the British Prime Minister uh, at a summit in 2011. And even though uh, they had on occasions got on very well, he turned on Cameron and said, we're sick and tired of you criticising us and telling us what to do. And a couple of months later, in December of that year, the Prime Minister used his veto, which you will remember. He was not prepared to see the rest of the EU sign up to a pact controlling budgets and spending without safeguards for Britain and the city. Now, the European press turned on Britain at that stage. Le Monde said, the Europeans have booted the English out of Europe. Well, not exactly. That was actually a deliberate reference to Joan of Arc, who before beating the English at Orléans, in 1429, as we all remember, is reported to have said, I am sent here by God, the King of Heaven, each and all, to put you out of all France. And certainly, in the French papers, perfidious Albion got a good kick. And there were plenty of references to an island which could run a headline, Fog in the Channel, Continent Cut Off. <laughs> the episode underlined that Britain has always had an ambivalent relationship with the European project. Winston Churchill had spoken of recreating the European family in a structure called, it may be, the United States of Europe. He was never clear what place in all this he envisaged for Britain. But he had also told the French leader, uh, Charles de Gaulle, that every time Britain has to decide between Europe and the open sea, it is always the open sea that we shall choose. Through the Thatcher years to the present, the relationship between Britain and the EU has remained uneasy. And David Cameron has warned that support for membership is way too thin. And we are promised uh, an in-out referendum around 2017 if Cameron <coughs> wins re-election. Now I should tell you, the Europeans are divided in their response. The French president has warned very strongly against allowing Britain to cherry what it likes and dislikes. But Britain has allies. And the rest of Europe is keen for the UK to remain on board. Do not buy into the view that it is Britain against the rest. It's much more complicated uh, than that. Uh, and I yesterday was uh, interviewing the Italian Prime Minister who is coming to Britain next week. And he will stress strongly that he believes that Britain not only should stay in Europe, but there can be a flexible Europe. So this argument is put to be uh, played out. And Angela Merkel sees the UK uh, as a, a counterbalance, if you like, to France. And she has gone out of her way to try and persuade David Cameron uh, to do his best to keep Britain in Europe. So we're going to see a very interesting dynamic uh, in, in, I think, in the months and years ahead. Interesting. After Angela Merkel made this big pitch for you know, Britain to stay in the EU, the most widely read German paper, which is Bild, wrote recently that, and you'll find this a little bit strange, some want the friends of mint sauce and those who drive on the left completely out of Europe. Uh, I don't think I've ever noticed to be called the friends of mint sauce, but there you go. <laughs> but anyway, the article in this very popular German magazine said, Dear Britain, dear Britons, please stay. You are so crazy. We need your opposition, your obstinacy rather than a united Europe. And above all, we love your quirky royals, your punk, your sense of humour. <laughs> so we do have some friends. 
Now, the UK wants a more flexible Europe and with countries enjoying different levels of membership. And as I said, many countries believe that in order to save the Eurozone, they will have to have a more integrated Europe. And some of them definitely see an opportunity to build the United States of Europe. And one should never forget that. There are people who believe in that and are working towards it. And the tension between those positions will be played out uh, in the next two to three years and will shape the future of Europe. Um, now, just one further thing to say. Uh, at the same time as those arguments are being played out, there is another big argument going on. And that is whether the medicine that has been handed to countries to try and help them, to save them, has actually turned out to make the patient worse. In prescribing austerity and reforms, did EU officials and the German government in particular get it wrong? By cutting debt and slashing spending, they were thought they were opening the way to growth and making these countries more competitive. But did they underestimate the impact of reducing uh, demand on countries which were already heading into a downturn? And this is the big question. In trying to save their project, have they broken parts of southern Europe? And we're going to hear more of this. And I, in uh, December, spoke to a very, very senior European official. And he said to me, you know, we've got two years. If in two years we don't see growth returning, all bets are off. Why? Because you can't sustain these levels of high unemployment. Uh, and you can't see some of the social deprivation which is happening in, in parts of Europe uh, without in the end there being um, uh, hope in the horizon. And, and as I say, they are acutely aware that uh, in the end they've got to show that this policy is working. And there are lots of doubts out there. Even the IMF recently uh, said that they had underestimated in relation to Greece and elsewhere the impact that some of these cuts uh, would have. And so this is the big question. Is in the end, and when I say by in the end, perhaps in the next year, will we begin to see uh, these countries return to growth? Some of the exports are already up. Will they begin to emerge stronger and leaner? In which case, the Germans and certainly the, the Brussels politicians who have shared that strategy will say, we were right. But it's also the great unknown, because at any stage, I think some of those countries are tinder dry. There are problems in Spain, in Portugal, in Greece. We'll see more about Greece in the coming week. Uh, some of those countries are really on the brink of saying, this may not work. So we're in a, uh, a very uh, fragile position. And I suppose the most fundamental challenge at the moment, as I see it, for the European Union, are millions essentially suffering because a dream, an honourable dream, a good dream in one way, but a flawed dream, did it turn dangerous? And my view is that Europe, our neighbourhood, is in a period of profound change and upheaval. And that's what I try to uh, capture and to cover uh, in this book of contemporary history. Uh, thank you for, uh, I'm bathed in sweat myself, so thank you for uh, listening to me.